sometimes it just takes a couple of minutes to tell one of Jesus' parables, but man, it's like, pow, it is full and packed with power. And so let's take a look at it as we uh, get to it today is Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. And if you get our sermon enhancer, I try to encourage you, to let you know about where we are, what we're going to be doing, so you can read ahead. Because the more you read, the better I sound, okay? The more you understand the context of what I'm talking about, it doesn't take a while for the train to leave the station. You're right on board with me right as we go along. Now, I encourage you this week to read even the preceding chapters uh, and passages so you could kind of get the fuller understanding. Sometimes we just take them individually. But when Jesus is preaching, he's telling story after story after story, and they're there for a purpose. They're there for a reason. Uh, One of the things he starts with back in chapter 24 is the day and the hour unknown. How many of you have uh, heard on the radio, you didn't hear it in church, I guarantee it, but you heard it on the radio, or not this church anyway, that this is going to be the year. Uh, What was it, about three years ago now, four years ago, when they said it was like May 25th, like May 25th at 3.32 p.m. is going to be the end of the world, Jesus is coming back, and you better get ready. Well, I know what the Scripture says, and still panics me a little bit. It's like, well, what do they know that we don't know? But I want you to go back every time, because somebody's going to predict it again. They predicted it years before that. And then they came back, let's see, when it didn't happen in May, they said, oh, we know what it was. Our math was off. It's going to happen in September. And somebody that was kind of... uh, Uh, kind of snide about the whole thing, said, well, all you people who think the end of the world is coming, would you please go ahead and sign over the deed to your house now if you really believe that? Because if he's coming back, you're not going to need it anyway. And and so if you're going to be gone, I'd love to have it. And they were like, no, I'm not going to sign over my deed to you. It's like, okay, then you don't really believe it either. And, you know, it it should just kind of give us cause to think, and yet we should live that way every day. We should always be prepared for his coming back because he says, no one knows the day or the hour. So the next time you hear some preacher on TV getting all hot and bothered about it and saying it's going to be in April, it's going to be in May, or these are the sign of the end times, you better get your life in order, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's like nobody knows the time. Nobody knows the day or the hour. How do we know that? Because Jesus told us, if Jesus says something, you can take it to the bank. Nobody except God knows that perfect time of when he's going to send Jesus to come back. And then he talks about, in chapter 25, the parable of the ten virgins. And uh, I I love the story about the little boy. He was learning about the virgins in the Bible. And at one point, he stopped his teacher and he said, can you tell me, was that the, the Mary mother virgin or was that the King James virgin? Isn't it interesting what children hear, right? Um. Two different things, in case you're not sure. I'll explain it to you later if you didn't get that one. Um, But the parable of the talents, uh, we we have the parable of the virgins, and then we have the parable of the talents. The virgins was all about being ready. There was 10 of them, but only five were really ready to wait the long time until the bridegroom came. And then when the bridegroom comes, the whole party goes in, and then they shut the doors, and everybody else is left out. Well, five of them ran out of oil because they really weren't prepared. And then the, with the parable of the talents, and he's, he's preparing his disciples like, I'm gonna be going away. And, and so, but I want you to know, I'm coming back again, but nobody knows. So just go ahead and be ready. That's the parable of the virgins. With the parable of the talents, he's teaching us that we are supposed to use our spiritual gifts for the building up of the kingdom now. You, you have in here the, the one guy who didn't use his, he buried his, and, and so when the king came back, he just gave it back to him just as it was. And it was like, you know, you wicked servant. And you say, like, how can he say wicked servant? Because you got back what you gave to him. He's like, no, it was given to you to be invested in used in building up the kingdom, investing in other people. And so it's teaching us how we're supposed to live by using our gifts for the building up of the kingdom. And then finally, on that day of reckoning, 
Um, anybody ever been around cattle or sheep or anything like that? You know, I, I've, I've worked with cattle more than I have, uh, well, I've never worked with sheep. So I've worked with cattle a lot more than I have with sheep. But there's, there's a time where you have to, to call them out and you have to separate them and, and somebody brave has to stand at the gate and, and let the good ones come in and let the ones that they're not supposed to keep them out. All right, and, and, and so there's a separation that's gonna take place. And what he's saying is the whole world is continuing to live in their own way, in their own lifestyle, and Christians are mixed all amongst them. They even say that about the church, that there's even some who are not really Christians who are inside the church. So, so coming to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Yeah, it's, it still didn't work. I don't, I don't know. I, you know it's, it does, it's not good if you have to explain it. But, but the point is, just because you walk into a church doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is if you give your heart sincerely to Jesus and then you try to live for him. But all the way through the world, all the way in the church, uh, we have all this mixture of people and Jesus is telling this. He's basically labeled, labeled them into two groups. There's going to be sheep and the goats. And so I want you to pay attention as we read this together and determine whether you want to be a sheep or a goat. All right, starting with verse 31, Matthew 25, verse 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on the throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and, I ga and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for the one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, I need everybody to take a deep breath for me. Sometimes we get to be the happy people of good news. And we like to share those messages and we like people to feel good. And um, sometimes you see churches that are growing all over, some of the very largest ones. I even heard one of the preachers from one of the largest churches in our nation, but certainly in the world, say, well, you know, uh, people feel bad enough as it is. I, I really don't think we need to talk about sin. <laughs> it's kind of like, you're a preacher of the gospel. It only works if you tell them the bad news so they can really appreciate the good news. And, and so it drives me crazy when you only get prosperity gospel, when you only get feel good kind of gospel, because I think that's Jesus light. I, I think that's not what we're called to do. We're called to read all the passages. And I just confess before you, this is kind of a heavy one. And, and so what we see here is the sheep and the goats. And he says to the sheep, you know, depart from me. You're going to go to the right. Now, remember what he says about the sheep. He said, you know, my people are my sheep and they know my voice 
and they follow me. Wherever he goes, we go with him. Whatever he thinks, we're supposed to learn how to think like him. We're supposed to act like him. And, and did we see him lording himself over everybody? You know, we get so caught up in the worldly kinds of things, and, and yet you never saw Jesus getting caught up in worldly kinds of things. And so sometimes it diminishes our own Christianity when we're so worried about where we're going to eat, where we're going to sleep, where we're going to, you know, uh, have clothes enough, all these things. He said, the world runs after these things. Don't focus on these kinds of things. It's not saying don't. I don't want you to show up naked next week, okay? Just don't. Please don't do that. But you, you get the point, is that we worry too much about those things. And I think what happens is when we're so worried, and I, and I think this, we have a scarcity mentality, is, is that we're always afraid that if we give to others, then we're not going to have enough for ourselves. I'll tell you it's true in the church when it comes to tithes and offerings because people feel like, well, that tithe thing, that's, that's just a good idea. It's not a command. Oh, no, it's a command. And yet most people don't do it. Most Christians don't do it. Why? Because they're afraid if they give a full 10% to the church, they won't have enough to live on. They won't have enough for their house. They won't have enough for their cars and their clothes or their insurance. And, and, and it's about putting the first things first and trusting God first. We don't give to the poor like we should because we're always afraid. Or sometimes arrogance creeps in. And I, and I know what's happened for me is, is that um, I, I grew up in a family that was comfortable but not wealthy. Um, now, this is going back into the early 80s, but my parents saved an entire $2,000 for my college education and said, here it is. God bless you. Go ye therefore and prosper. Um, if you don't know, $2,000 doesn't go back very far, and it didn't back in, in the 80s either. And so I had to work my way through college. I put that $2,000 in the bank and a few years later, when I was ready to get married, we had a $2,000 cushion because I worked every single day. And so I was blessed to be able to live at home where I didn't have a rent or anything like that. But everything I made went into preparing for my future. And I think what happens to many of us, particularly in America, is to say, because you remember those kids. You remember the ones that didn't study. You remember the ones that were constantly failing in school, and then they didn't, they didn't hardly graduate high school if they graduated, and then they certainly didn't go on to college, and they got into dead-end jobs, and then they got mad at their boss, and there's, it's this constant cycle of not having jobs and not having money. And then you have those of us who have said, I did it my way. I pulled myself up for my bootstraps. I got up when I didn't want to get up. I went to work when I didn't feel like working. I went to school so that I could get a decent paying job so I can take care of a, a wife and kids and family. And what's behind that, though, is this arrogance that says, I did it on my own. I got mine. You go get yours. And we have the poor all around us, and it just is overwhelming. I am not preaching at you this morning because I don't have all the answers, but I know that we're supposed to care for them. And what I'm really going after is our heart on how we handle and how we engage the widow, the poor, the orphan, those who cannot speak for themselves then we have the responsibility of reaching out to them just like Jesus did and caring for them. And he's actually saying that this is the grading point, okay? He's saying that those who live their life this way, caring for the poor, you're my sheep. You're doing what you're supposed to do. You remember when he restored Peter? Jesus, or Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep feed my sheep. It's what we're supposed to be doing is caring for the world, caring for the widow, the poor, the orphan, those who have no voice of their own. So let's take a look at our outline uh, from this morning. And the first one is to be prepared. Anybody a scout out there? 
I know it's in the Boy Scouts. Be prepared is their motto. Be prepared. I don't know about the Girl Scouts. I don't know if they're supposed to be prepared or not, but I know the Boy Scouts, they are supposed to be prepared. And I want to tell you, just confess, I was not always prepared. I'm not always prepared. Um, in, in fact, what this, <laughs> this, this one is really saying is procrastinators beware. Anybody a confess procrastinator? Some of you are late in raising your hand. You, yeah, no. That's funny, people. Come on, yeah, come on. All right, well, I was called a procrastinator the first time. I was 10 years old. I was in fifth grade, and I was looking into the face of Mrs. Villadonga. And she was still only about five feet tall, but she was about a foot taller than me. And I had done my homework. I was one of these anxious kids that couldn't not do the homework. Our children didn't get that gift because they just could do homework at home and then forget to turn it in. It's like, how do you do that? We're anxious people. You can't not turn it in. It's a part of your grade. My son would get A's on every exam and get a C in the class. It's like, how do you do that? He said, ah, I forgot to turn in my homework. How do you forget to turn in your homework? But this day, I didn't turn in my homework. And I was panicked. And so I went to te and teacher, I promise you, I did it. I, it's, and, and I just was going to hurry this morning. And I left without it. It's right at home. And can I turn it in tomorrow? And and she said, you did it? And I said, yes, ma'am, I did it. She said, well, you're still getting counted off because you didn't bring it in. I said, I promise you I did it. Well, why didn't you put it in your book last night? Because, well, I forgot and I meant to do it this morning. And she said, Mr. Freeze. I'm like, oh, man, whatever they call you by the last name, it's never good. Mr. Freeze, you are a procrastinator. Yes, ma'am, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those. What is that? And now I got a new homework assignment. Mr. Freeze, your new homework assignment is to go home and look up procrastinator and come back in the morning and tell me what it means. I have never forgotten what it was because I looked it up and it said, Greg Freeze, right there. And I was like, man, I'm a procrastinator. Well, a lot of times we have a tendency to put off things that we think we're going to get to later. You ever heard the A pile, the B pile, and the C pile? The A are the things you have to get done. The B is you probably should get to it. C is you don't work on it until somebody starts screaming. And most of us, everything is in the C pile. It's all one big pile until they start screaming, and then you start flipping through your papers and saying, I got that in here somewhere, I, I know. But that's when it becomes important. But Jesus is saying the day and the hour, no one knows. And it's not for us procrastinators to just relax. It's time to be engaged and say, we can't wait until Jesus comes back to start acting like Jesus. We have a responsibility now to start acting like Jesus. We are pre be prepared for his coming back any day, any time, any moment, any hour. And that's not a threat. It's, it's actually good news when he comes back for those who are ready. But our first point this morning is we've got to be ready. We've got to persevere in learning to be more like Jesus. Number two, there will be a test. All right. Yeah, you, you had them. Maybe you were that student. I was that student that knew somebody else was going to ask it, so I never had to. The teacher's writing new information on the board. And, uh, and there's a lot of teachers here. I could probably ask you all what you do. Um, but she's writing new information on the board, and people are rolling their eyes and like, oh, here we go again. There's something new. And finally, some guy in the back will go, um, hey, teacher, is this going to be on the test? You know, because the question is really saying, I have no idea what you're really talking about. And if it's not going to be on the test, it really has no influence on my life whatsoever. However, if I'm going to see it again, then maybe you better go over it one more time so I can really get it down and understand. And, and so for those of you who are in Christ Jesus, sometimes we're living on cheap grace. We just say, give your life to Jesus and everything's going to work out fine. And then you come across a parable like this and you realize there's going to be a test. It's all on the test. Oh my goodness. I better wake up. I better start paying attention. Now, I will tell you, um, when we got into college, it was more like, not, okay, first it's going to be, is this going to be on the exam? In college, you don't have to ask it because the answer is yes. 
In fact, I'm convinced they go somewhere else to get their questions for the exams because they wasn't in my book. I'm just telling you, all right? But, but not only that, but sometimes it's going to be, you know, is it going to be essay? I hated the essay ones. Uh, you, you never could write enough to get full credit for an essay one. And then there was the multiple choice. It's like, okay, I at least got a 50-50 shot. I can usually narrow down to one or two. I hated none of the above, all right? But you can narrow it down to one or two and say, okay, now I got a 50-50 shot. Uh, Let's go with this one. Um, But at least there was an answer given, and you, you felt more comfortable about that. And then there was those tasks that were just simply pass, fail. One question, and it was pass, fail. Now, a lot of us would just kind of relax and go, okay, good. Because as I look around the world, I'm not the best person in the world, but I'm not the worst either. Hopefully, God grades on a curve. God does not grade on a curve. And I don't want you to relax because passing means you get to to be a sheep. You get to go into heaven. You get to be with Jesus for all of eternity. If you're a goat and you fail, then you're separated for all of eternity. And so you need to hear this and you need not to fall asleep and you need to pay attention and you need to be in Bible studies. You need to be in church. You need to take on the mind of Jesus because there will be a test. Number three is we will be judged about how we care for the poor. We will be judged even the Christians will be judged. You need to hear that. And so there is this building up of uh, our treasures in heaven. How do we build up treasures in heaven? You can't send your IRA. You can't. Uh, I, I heard this the story the other day. The guy was telling about his, um, his uncle was very rich. And he left strict instructions for his checkbook to go into the casket with him. And it's like, really, dude? You know? Kind of like J.D. Rockefeller. How much did he leave behind? All of it. You cannot take it with you. And the question is, how did you use the gifts you were given while you were here? And so we are called to be transformed. We're called to have compassionate hearts. We're called to be able to, to care for those who cannot care for themselves. In the business world, you care for those who can do something for you. I'm nice to this person because one day they might be able to give me a raise. They might be able to get me a job. They might be able to get me, me, me. You're doing it for yourselves. The question is, how do you care for those who are less than you, who don't have the gifts, who can do nothing for you? The widow, the poor, the orphan, how do we care for them? We are called to, to care for them. And Jesus says, when you've done it to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me. I want to share with you a story about uh, William Barclay. Um, he's a commentator, and he tells the story of St. Francis of Assisi. Many of you have heard of St. Francis. He's the one that's kind to animals, and you'll see his name on veterinary hospitals and all that kind of stuff. St. Saint Francis of Assisi. Um, but St. Francis was, was born into a wealthy family. And said when he was young, he was wealthy and high-spirited, which meant he could do anything he wanted to do. He had the power to do it. And at, you know, toward, you know, at the end of his young life, he just found it wanting. He had everything he'd wanted, and he was still dissatisfied with life. And he felt like there just needed to be more. And so he began praying and, and praying about uh, being more and more like Jesus. And they said one day that he was on a horse, which being on a horse back in his day, that you were wealthy if you owned a horse. And so he, he owned a horse and he was riding by and he saw a leper. If, um, if you understand about leprosy, it's very contagious. In fact, if you're a leper, you're supposed to live outside of the city. And if anybody starts coming near you, if they're passing you on a road, you're supposed to get off the road and cry out, unclean, unclean. So the people would know to stay way away from you. St. Francis did exactly the opposite. He was riding by and he saw this leper that was horribly disfigured. And he jumped down on his horse, off his horse, and he went over and embraced the man. And just after a long, tight embrace, he grabbed him by the shoulders to look him into the eyes and, 
And when he looked, he saw the face of Jesus. Many of us can't imagine leaping off our safety and engaging with somebody who has a disease that is so contagious. And yet Jesus is telling us, you never know when it's angels unaware. And so if you've done it to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me. And finally, number four is pray for Jesus transforming grace. So maybe you're like me. When I was studying for this one, I didn't feel too good about it because I know I can get better about this. My compassion level sometimes runs a little bit um, on, the, on the low side. And part of it is because I feel like there's so many people out there that need so much and I can't fix them. I can't help them. Um, but the scripture says, give a cup of cold water. You know, give a little bit of food. Give them a coat. Do something for them. And, and so uh, if you're like me, I have to get better in this area. And so we, even if you realize it and your heart's not there, you say, I need the heart of Jesus. And so just invite Jesus to come deeper into your heart, into your life, his transforming grace that we would truly take on his heart. And this is not something that we would have to do. This is something that we would want to do to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that when he comes again, we will be ready. We will be able to rejoice. We will be received into his kingdom. And we all long to hear those last and final words from Jesus to us as we're standing at the gate. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in.